I generally believe that we are moving into like a new space uh, where a human um, or humanity evolution is happening. And then we are moving into, I would say like a sapient five. Uh, so human 5.0 uh, version of human. So kind of creative human. That's what I would say um, uh, I would call this. And we coming, we're coming from a very, you know, long evolution process, right? As humanity overall, where obviously work as a term has evolved a lot. And we came really like from the 1.0 kind of way, social. Like we actually started, it's funny that we talk about social networks and social, social, but actually we started with being social uh, just for a reason that we couldn't survive otherwise, right? Like we had to be social to make fire. We had to be social to, you know, find something to eat, uh, kill an animal in this case uh, back then, right? Or like find berries and stuff like that. And at some point we, we become uh, 2.0, like we become this upgraded, more like intellectual human being. So we, we suddenly were um, uh, in, in philosophy, right? Like uh, we started debating, asking questions and, and started to reflect uh, why we are doing things. And I think that's where like the term work in generally was in generally coined uh, and ethically kind of reflected in, in a much deeper sense. Uh, and, and at some point, um, from there, we moved into this next evolution of 3.0. I would say it's like individual. So that's where suddenly we re realized that we are, uh, we have an individual character that we, that we are able, um, to, you know, create figures and pictures of human beings and put them uh, on a wall. And it's not uh, only reserved for the gods to be depicted this way. And that, uh, obviously, it, it led to explosion of science, right? Like research science and the whole like foundation for the industrial revolution that at, at, some, at some point ultimately led to sort of sapient 4.0. That's where I think we are right now, uh, the global human. So we, we kind of realized through that exponential industrial uh, evolution that we, we can be interconnected, that we don't have to work our, on our own. Like we don't have to do everything ourselves. We can build machines and then suddenly machines can do all that work for us. So we can be even more individual, intellectual and social. So that that's, I think, right now um, on, 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 on that scale um, where we are maybe as a human or as a humanity uh, in that global globalized world. And I think why we need to talk about work and kind of redefine what it means for us or what it means for the humanity is because in that world, we see technology taking more and more driving force or a, a speed that is hardly understood and, 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 and it's really hard to reflect what it means to us. So this technology and acceleration is, is so much um, in the field um, uh, um, of our development that we need to think and ask ourselves, do we need something like a creative uh, exponential creativity movement? So do we need to, to start, like what is the human answer to what we have created? as technology, because technology is not something imposed uh, by, by, by nature or by gods or someone else. It's something we created. So we put it out there to help us uh, do things that we like to do and make things easier and avoid uh, actually a lot of manual work. But on the other hand side, we see that this technology is kind of becoming almost like a life. So it's, it, it's, it's becoming, it becomes like its own, on, it, it becomes like its own uh, you know, God, uh, like it becomes its own power. So, and so, so, sometimes I, I have a feeling that we don't control that anymore. And, uh, and here we come to this kind of core question about fluid work, because I think human, um, um, has been always very flexible. Um, before the industrialization came into how we work, we were very intuitive. We, we were trying to understand what really good at and, and, you know, we, we, we didn't think that much about all that stuff before we become so, you know, automated and intellectual. So it, the question that I would love to, to discuss today is um, how can we become or how, how can we get back to that, you know, world of being creative 
and 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 would it then be something where we need to re rework the way we understand um, our activities, maybe also learn from others. And that's like one last thing I wanted to share that um, for me, my biggest inspiration come not necessarily from the work that I do with, with the Mittelstand, like family businesses or startups or big corporates, but more come from the music uh, because I, I've been a musician since a very long time. And what I see there, you know, we always talk about the gigs like in, in the music or in arts, uh, it's always normal to say like, I have a DJ gig or I have, I have, a, I have, a, I have a gig with my band. And, uh, and then sometimes you have a tour, like you have a few gigs. So we played a lot of them with my band, Tim and Tiger. And it's kind of, it's kind of my question at some point, right? Why are we able in the art world to do this kind of things flexibly? And, and, and we never really ask like, why do I play this gig, gig with you? Like we, we need a keyboard or we need a drummer. Like you will find one and we'll just team up, play and then, and then, and then it's done. Why can't we do the same thing in, in the economy? Why do we always have to have so much structure? And why, why do we seek so much, um, for like having this control? Uh, and maybe, maybe it's because we came from that, uh, globalized industrial world where the work has been defined. And these are the questions that I would love to to uh yeah open up and 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 see how this dialogue evolves um and uh, i would love to see how we can yeah figure out a, a, an interesting way to make a formation and um, um a formation uh, uh or maybe reformation of the way we look at it and to um open up the dialogue i also uh want to start with the sound uh, obviously um of the song formation and uh, <laughs> and here you are now uh, let's open up the dialogue so as i understand we're supposed to grab something from the center of the stage to uh, get the talking stick, I guess. So I'm just gonna grab that stick for a little bit and um, thank you, uh, Evgeny, for this wonderful introduction to the topic. Uh, there's a lot to think about when you think about the future of work and the way that work has been evolving and the way that COVID has proposed us into this future already without any sort of preparation. Uh, we companies had to adapt, employees had to adapt, and the whole discussion around work and what it means to be an employee today is has changed and evolved in such ways that we are forced to think about things like mental health and well-being and how this integrates into the workplace. Uh, we are forced to rethink the way that we are skilled and the way that we upskill ourselves. Uh, we are forced to think about how we can belong uh, in an organization in a more fluid way by being able to have more broad knowledge rather than specific specializations. Um, we are also forced to think about uh, our output versus how driven by the mission we are, uh, whether it's due to the whole millennial generation who is uh, motivated by mission-driven uh, uh, opportunities or whether it's actually an entire generation of employees who are more concerned by their impact on, on, on their world around them and their environment and what it is that they're doing. I think that all of those uh, subtopics are super important when considering the future of work and what it means to be today employed uh, or to be a freelancer or to be any sort of uh, worker. Um, I think those are things that I think about all the time. And uh, I look at my experience. I'm some transitioning uh, uh, careers. Uh, I was in communications and I'm moving into uh, project management. And uh, I've always been someone with a broad range of skills. And I realized that this has helped me a lot in my career in terms of how I define myself and what I'm able to do. Um, 
and uh, to be able to find a workplace where this is valued and this is recognized and this is celebrated and this is encouraged is I think really, really lucky because a lot of the uh, enterprises around me at least are still uh, set in their ways of uh, specialization and uh, particular outcomes and stuff like that. So. Um, I think, yeah, those are some things that I think about every day, actually. <laughs> and uh, I bring back the talking stick to the center of the stage. And I will grab it. Thank you for that. Um, thank you for that uh, introduction and those questions, which I really find very, very interesting. Um, my background is that I'm self-employed since 2009, and I opened a co-working space in 2010, not in a big city, but in a rural area. And we always were on that question, how can we cooperate with each other? How can we find um, the projects and points where we can work together instead being rivals and that's one of the of the key um, sentences that we have have in german it's like um, cooperation statt konkurrenz which loosely translates to let's cooperate instead of being rivals um, and that unleashes uh, in my view and in my um, experience a lot of creativity if you stop thinking um, in terms of um, how can I crush my opponent uh, in, 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 the, in the market? Uh, how can I get more um, um, customers and start thinking about how can we cooperate and what are your strengths, what are my strengths um, 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 and to find that. So um, that's what we're doing in the co-working space. It's space, spaces uh, since 2010 already, and which now got through, through the pandemic situation, um, a lot of boost um, and, and a lot of people are talking about um, um, co-working in general. But I also think a lot of people misunderstand what, what happens there. And what, what we find um, is the core um, thing of, of co-working um, is like the community. And that's just what you're talked about. How can we go back to the to the community feeling? It's not about renting a desk and and um, having a high class office. It's about finding your community and finding that co working space and that community that fits that fits your life and and what you want to do and and find the people that you want to do it with. Um, and then in that space, um, um, have like um, that that serendipity factor of um, stumbling over people with talents and experiences that just fit to something that you just thought about and then starting like a project a little one a big one or something together so that's that's where i see that that creativity that you, that you talked about and having those those gigs like from the um, um, music world is like having that conversation um, um, during during lunch break and then like two hours later starting on, on a project together and, and developing something new together that, that you haven't thought about like four hours earlier. Um, um, and I see those, those gigs like like the sprints maybe in, in the software world where you where you really try to to band together, get your sprint done and then and then the team can can be flexible and change again. Um, so yeah, and, and what we do also because um, Dara, you talked about like what is motivation, where does it come from, and how can we impact um, um, our surroundings, and that's something that I see developing in the co-working spaces also, like where we motivate each other, where we talk about um, stuff like being sustainable, and a lot of people come in and say and think they they are on on uh, yeah we've heard about sustainability, but then in that in that um, creative atmosphere, there there come. These are discussed topics, and then they get uh, new ideas get developed around that topic. So that's where I, for me and myself, see and for my community, see that part of of creativity and and, and community. Yeah, well, I will take this stick and 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 talk about that word community because you mentioned something very important to me, and I also wanted to. Um, say that for me, the driving force behind all these questions is also very uh, connected to the idea of community. But I also believe that we do not necessarily have the same understanding of what community really is about or what it means. And um, I think um, it's 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 interesting that 
to talk about it more like on two dimensions. I think um, you have uh, you have to have a lot of trust uh, and you have to have a lot of shared beliefs to be a community. And I think a lot of uh, people, who, for example, also build co-working spaces. And I would I would love to hear how it is for you because it's really interesting. Uh, they they might have really like more uh, a functional understanding of a community, but actually community from the original uh, where do you have communities like in churches like you know like in religion you have a lot of communities uh, why because you have shared beliefs that's what you actually start with and as soon as you have a shared belief then and you start meeting physically that's also difficult in the current COVID time but if you have already met a lot of people you probably know the difference um, if you talk to someone you trust um, virtually uh, and you've met someone personally or if you talk to someone you need to kind of imagine uh, in your head without having met uh, and without built that trust relationship before. It's a very different situation. And I think if you if you are not having this trust and, and shared beliefs, then I would rather say, let's talk about networks and groups. And, and if you really don't have any of that, let's talk about crowds. Because I think, I think we often compare uh, a community with a crowd, but a crowd, if you say, I want to do something, uh, let's say go to a city which is crowded and then you know there are a lot of people you could say it's community of uh, of my city like like there but would you start a project with everyone who is like there uh, accidentally in a cafe or somewhere like uh, or maybe on the street even or on the bus um would you do it probably not why because you think ah but is it the person i trust is it the person i can work with like all these questions pop up and I think that that's exactly why I want to talk about this idea of fluid work uh, from because so far organizations has have helped us bringing people together that do have sort of like a common interest, at least, or common and, and, and common understanding of what they're doing it for. And here we have this connection to the purpose of a, a company. And at some point we kind of lost a little bit that idea that every organization should have a purpose. And that's why the work became very mechanical. So instead of talking about why I'm doing this work, we, we started being very functional, started talking about, yeah, I, I, I do it because here I get more money and that's why I do it here. And that's why we kind of lost that idea of being a community as part of the organization to being just a group working, um, maybe even just a crowd that is just hired to do a certain job. and. And, and, and that's why maybe our idea of that work became less meaningful. But actually, if you consider an organization starting with a purpose and finding people based on that purpose, you can build very uh, fluid organizations as well that would have the, exactly this co-working as a core principle of every project that is done, because that would be the ideal organization I would want to work with. And just to end this, uh, idea is like that's one of the reasons like in our new Mittelstand movement we are completely a, com a community oriented that means that it has to start with a purpose and if people feel attracted or attached to that person to, to that purpose then only then it makes sense to talk about uh, becoming part of that community and start building a trust relationship to actually be able to work together quicker and understand like languages bridge processes tooling, all the mechanics of working. And I think uh, that's what we need to come back to, to really think organization needs to have a purpose. And then if we build a lot of organization that are purposeful, then I think that fluid work becomes much, much less complicated. And, and then you don't need to control everything because you say either you are with me or you are, you don't, don't want to want something else, then I can't really control that. So I, you know, go work somewhere else, basically, because you probably don't want the same what we want, and then maybe we shouldn't work together in this case, even if we need your skills for some reason. So yeah, that I would love to hear what you think about this idea of purpose and what it would mean, to, you know, for the work and how to balance it um, with like functional needs that people have uh, to be secure, to have enough, uh, you know, money to live and. And, 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 you know, it's always a balance in between these more, uh, yeah, um, abstract concepts and more human uh, basic needs. Yeah. 
yeah, I forgot that. <laughs> um, yes, you need, for for a community, you need shared beliefs, and um, in the in the um, co-working community, um, I think people um, you cannot open a co-working space and then after two weeks say, yeah, we are now have a community. So what we always say is you need at least two years to build up a, a community in a new opened um, co-working space so that you find those people and those people stay that have a shared belief of how, how that work and that uh, particular um, co-working space should be and then what, what the purpose and values should be. Um, so yeah, totally behind that. Um, and th that's also why every co-working space is different because the people that are in those in those co-working spaces are different and they uh, can develop a different um, um, value system and um, um, yeah they can be totally different and that's also you said purpose and i'm totally yes with that uh, whenever a startup comes in and uh, talks to me about um, how how can we how can we um, found out that company i always talk what's your purpose start with that um, let's talk about why you want to do it yeah we want to earn a lot of money think again what do you really want to do what do you want to how, how do you want to help the world and then you can yeah, then, then we can talk about why you need money for that um, but it's always the purpose but also and that's what i think also you need the people um, you can have you can have two people that have to, totally the same purpose that have the same beliefs but still don't get along with each other and still have somehow can't smell each other you would say in german uh, we have that experience also um, so you need you need the purpose and you need to, the people that fit together and want to build a team and, and the community and and work on that purpose together um, um, so I would say it's, it's purpose and the right people put together that can really change something in the world. Um, and the topic today is fluid work. So yes, we need fluid organizations to have fluid work. And that, 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 that's uh, something you said that I found really, really interesting. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I actually also worked at the co-working space for a couple of years and my job was to create community and my KPI was to create it in three months. And I, I told them it's not that's not the way it works. Community takes time. You have to weave people in together. You have to create opportunities for serendipity. And this is something that really takes a lot of time. Uh, but it's very interesting what you said about companies needing to be fluid for fluid work to be able to happen. And that's so important. The way that is are organized currently does not allow for this kind of fluid work. And it's a fundamental change that needs to happen at the core of how companies organize themselves and how managerial positions are set and, and how that trickles down on, onto the rest of the organization. Uh, so evidently, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of trying to um, trying to propagate that kind of uh, way of doing things that is more humane, that is more uh, in tune with what people need, what people want, what people can do. Uh, the, I, the whole idea of it's a question of ability, not age or experience, I think is super important. What can people do actually? And what can make them, what are their strengths that will make them succeed and thrive in their position uh, and at this organization? And uh, and all of this helps build community. If you're, if you're doing something that you're connected to, that you're satisfied of doing, and that speaks to your abilities and your strengths, you're going to want to belong to the community and you're going to want to do whatever it is that you can do to help this community thrive. And this is what makes it a, a more interesting experience than traditional work experiences, basically. But here comes a question to Christopher. Like, I know that you're in Weitlingen because you put it in there and you have a, a, a beautiful university there as well. I don't know how beautiful it is. I actually not been in a university. I know EBS, uh, business school. And that's why I like the idea of zooming out. Like we come from like that human uh, fluid work means you need fluid structures and organization, but now a fluid organization would need a fluid economy. And um, if in the economy we need to control uh, and, and, and plan and everything has to be static and, and and, and plan for five years, like then, then how can you then 
say you would hire someone for three hours and then let, let someone else jump in and say, how do you do that? And so the question here is, um, what do you think would be the foundation in, 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 with all the technological progress and all the uh, humanity evolution that we have uh, achieved so far? Like, uh, what do you think will be the foundation in, that would allow us to create such organizations in a fluid manner that would empower like fluid work to happen really? And how, how do we deal with it? Do we need basic income? Do we need, uh, how do we need that? How do we create a basic stability that people would feel uh, secure enough? Uh, that would be one option. Or how do we maybe learn from artists in this case, how to accept the insecurity or insecurity of the situation overall that you can't control it in any case and then be kind of fluid as a nature, like, um, because that would change the whole way of looking at the thing that that would bring us to the question of inner work that is required to achieve that fluidity. So um, that would be interesting to see uh, both like either do, what do we need to do as a foundation for like inner work um, in transformation to come to that um, individually or how can we empower overall system to, uh, you know, empower uh, fluidity in organizations? What do you think? Uh, maybe we can brainstorm a few of the possible foundations that uh, because we probably don't know how it will go, but uh, I would be curious to hear uh, what your thoughts on that are. I can say something to that. Um, basic income is something that comes to mind um, um, uh, in, in, the, in the topic we talked about. So um, right now, yes, I think basic income would be one way to go, and I would I would like to see that happen and see what happens after that. A, a lot of people here fear that then people will just uh, be lazy and laid back, um, and I don't I don't really believe that. Maybe they are there are some that would do it. I still don't find that even even wrong or something. Um, so yeah, with with all that, that technology coming and work even getting getting less in a way, um, um, or or changing a lot, um, I think uh, basic income is, is something that would let you or let everyone um, decide more freely to what you really want to do because there are we are somehow in a privileged position we can think about what we want to do. Uh, a lot of people on this world don't have that freedom or don't have that privilege to even think about. They just have to do what they have to do. They can't think about, is this that what I want to do? No, I need that money. I need that to live on. Um, so we are in a privileged position here and basic income can, can change that um, privileged, privileged position to everyone else also. But it's also a cultural change. So it just won't work to just, yeah, now we have basic income uh, without having a cultural shift, without talking about that cultural shift, um, um, without um, um, discussing that with everyone. What does that mean now? What, what does it mean um, to have that freedom to, to think about what I want to do and how do, I, how do I think about that? Even a lot of people I meet in the co-working space don't know how to think about what they really want to do. So that's that's a big topic. And also there always will be people that are more on the security side of things and will always want to work like for a company because they think that is more secure. Uh, and I think that's also totally fine. When we when I started uh, 2009, 2010 with, with co-working, we, we worked on that thesis that everybody should be self-employed. Uh, I changed that um, um, over the over the last ten years because I I don't think that's correct, but that was always the mindset we had. But I still think a lot more people than are self-employed today should be self-employed, and we should have a real focus um, on that way of 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 living. Uh, I love that. I actually work in the entrepreneurship space, uh, entrepreneurship education particularly, and uh, our mission is to make sure that entrepreneurship is a basic education right to everyone so that everyone can have the opportunity to launch their own business or to be self-employed. And I think that's extremely important these days because uh, 
the way that the world is growing, I believe a lot more of people will be self-employed in the future and will have the opportunity to create their own businesses. Um, and the world is shifting towards a lot more of uh, niche communities that are uh, banding in together in order to create something positive together. So, so these entrepreneurs will be so important in the future. And th this is what essentially will redefine the way big enterprises work as well, because they will need to attract such talent. And to attract such talent, they will need to provide them the fluidity, the constant um, uh, de-structuring of, of, uh, of uh, traditional uh, structures, basically. And they will have to provide the psychological safety of letting people experiment and fail. Because if you don't fail, you will never innovate. And this is something that traditional organizations do not provide and traditional rigid work does not provide as well. So I really think that this psychological safety is super important. There's two things that came out of, out of this conversation that I will keep in mind. It's trust and community. And to have that, you need psychological safety. There are companies trying to give that um, already. So uh, um, I was talking at Bosch at one time and, and we talked a, bit, a little bit about how they do that. And they have like an internal startup um, program where people can can try to do a new idea, but inside of Bosch with all the security they have, with all the networking and infrastructure they have, but working on their own ideas. And um, another big company, BASF here in, in, in near Mannheim, is also having that. And what came out of there is they're doing um, um, a lot of co-work. They're, op they're opening a lot of co-working spaces like around, around that company. So the people working at that company can also choose to work in those co-working spaces. So a lot of innovative ideas are coming out of there. So I think the first companies are really trying to do that. But what we also see is that as long as you're in the security of of such a company and get that get that monthly paycheck you're you're not as you're, you're not a real startup in the sense of going the risk working through the nights if you have to um, chasing every opportunity to to get bigger or, or get get your startup on the road um, and, and and that's something where we see differences in that um um, just being a startup, like in the, in the in the sense we all understand, and being a startup inside of a company with all those benefits you already have there. So that's also a really interesting development, which we look at and 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 want to see how does that work and and how are the people working in those um, um, startups. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very curious to talk about one word that you mentioned luxury because it's actually one of the questions that i also wrote down up front about whether like having access to this kind of fluid work is a luxury and only the chosen ones have that profile to do so and it's interesting yesterday i actually accidentally stumbled upon a documentary from the book uh, you probably uh, know the capital uh, the, the standard uh, book about uh, how capital evolved, right? And I, I, I just, I actually didn't really want, want to watch it, but then suddenly, it, you know, it was kind of was kind of interesting to just recapitulate on these um, pictures what you know what exactly was happening visually because uh, I find it quite revealing. So for me, as you talked about luxury, a question came to mind: Are we moving into the world of like modern slavery? Because um, why I'm asking this controversial question is like, um, if you think about how the capital was distributed, it was primarily based on ownership of, of land. Like right? back then, everyone who owned land was just er earning that basic income basically from taxes and, and, and lending it to others. And then you could just like, yeah, you could just like go and, uh, and do whatever you like, like have a social life, etc. And interestingly, we don't think about this now, but if you look into how capital is distributed in a digital world, it's a very similar development where you have also a few big tech platforms, which is the new land, or maybe you have the data that is the new gold. And then 
and whoever owns the platform kind of owns the land, right? Like then everyone who would be the gig player in that world would be kind of without knowing, following the rules of that platform, right? So, and here comes this question that you said, like everyone should be like self-employed. I think it's also a great idea, but I'm wondering even if everyone were was able to be self-employed and, and happy like that and was capable of doing that and, and, and was successful, still would have very quickly very powerful concentration of power happening because after revolution, right, uh, we saw that once already, like, you know, the, the aristocracy, like everyone was gone and suddenly banks uh, appeared. Uh, so it, it's like whatever we think do, uh, you know, now banks are being disrupted by Bitcoin, but then still Bitcoin is in, in, in the hand of a few, most of us at least, and etc. Like whatever thing we do, it always gets concentrated very quickly to someone who figured it out and 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 and, and monopolize it somehow. So why maybe we really need to step back and and think about with all degree of that automate automatization. Why don't you know don't the, the cities and institutions and politicians will have to play a much bigger role? in providing that kind of infrastructure because only the basic income would not be probably enough. You would need to create also infrastructure like the roads in that new world that people could also be working independently. Otherwise, the basic income would kind of create just a different way of maybe digital slaves. I, I'm just like being provocative, <laughs> but that's the question that I often think about. How do we really solve it in a human way that it's good for everyone and not just good for very few. I don't always have to go first, Dara, if you want to go first this time. <laughs> I'm thinking, uh, this, this made me think a lot because uh, there's, Privilege and luxury have several layers to, uh, to them. And uh, coming from a country that's very much a third world country, uh, this conversation is a little bit beyond what I can hope and dream for my country. Um, there's a lot of things that we discussed today, like basic income that we will never see. Um, and uh, so few organizations here will adopt fluid work. Uh, so it's up to individuals to create their own opportunities to have these kinds of experiences and to find this kind of fulfillment. So it's really um, uh, challenging to think about these concepts and to try to put yourself in, in a situation, in a mindset where you, you can dream of the future in a way where you have those opportunities, you know what I mean? Um, so definitely this is something that I will take with me after this discussion to think about. Um, I think a lot of people would argue that we already are in a world where we have like modern slaves um, and that capitalism in itself is just um, always going to be that way. Th that's a lot of stuff that, that, that you can read on, on the internet and a lot of people are saying that. Um, and it really makes you think, I mean, what are we talking on right now? It's notebooks, where do they come from? Some companies and we don't really know if there are kids putting those together or not. And if kids are putting together our cell phones and our notebooks, then then we are having modern slavery, um, and 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 we are are like kind of participating in it. So yeah, now now we really took a step back in, into a whole worldview, but that's definitely something we we should do and we should talk about, um, um, and. How, but how does this fluid work and how does um, that topic that we have could cha change that? I think if everyone is connecting with the purpose of what they're doing, 
then those questions come up and you can discuss them. If you're just having a work place where you function at, you don't you don't think on that level because you're just, I have to do that. That's what I have to do, eight hours, and then I go home and do something totally different. And I don't care about what I did at work. And I don't care about what my company does. But we're now in a, in a, in a discussion in a world um, where we can start to think about why is my company doing that? Is that really something I want to, I want to, um, um, I want to be a part of, and and um, have do I have a possibility to change that? Yeah. So whenever I talk with startups, we also talk about um, the question: What are companies or what are what are um, fields that you never want to work with? And a lot of people then say, "Oh, I never want to work with companies that um, develop or or are part of something that that creates weapons." Yeah. Um, and, and th that that's kind of a new discussion. I don't know. I didn't think we had that ten years ago in that in that deepness. But that now that's something all, all the startups are saying um, um, directly. And there are also a lot of young startups that are that are really trying to to uh, do something good. And that's also why like social impact hub, social entrepreneurship, and that stuff is is really really a big topic. Um, um, but yeah, how. How do we, there's also a lot of people who are not thinking about that. There's also a lot of people who are just working somewhere and really don't want to think about that. And my question is, how can we start a conversation with them? How can we get them to, to start thinking about those topics where we are like maybe even years ahead because we already thought about that a lot. But how do we get those people um, interested in, the, in those topics? I mean, look in your neighborhood, how many people are really um, um, thinking about that stuff and how many people are just, I don't want to think about it. I want to live my life and I don't want to change anything about it. Um, maybe to close or wrap it up indeed is I think there isn't many maybe solutions to that and indeed social entrepreneurship is one. I believe that there is also a solution to, and that's why I'm also focusing on this segment of Mittelstand or family businesses, to find the companies or entrepreneurs who are independent in thinking and nature and capital structure and, and make them think of a different vision for a future that would be the world where they would be caring about collaboration uh, about ethics, uh, about planet, people, and profit in a balanced way, and let them be the starting point to basically redistribute power and capital in a more equal way. I think that would be a way to deal with it. At least one positive scenario that I can imagine for you, for your like thinking you, from a European perspective here, because that's how European economy kind of works. It's very bottom up and um, and actually, I think that would be a beautiful picture, at least for me, um, how that could evolve. And I, I hope then in this case, it would foster more independent small companies thinking about how can I be better for not only me, but also three other companies around me in a collaborative way. And that will be the actual fluid collaboration and fluid work that I would think would be exciting Let, let's if we and we need to start somewhere so it's 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 a very difficult point to have a you know a vision to, to what what you started with that's why we we're doing that with this family business and i hope that that there will be also startups like zebras movement is already trying to do it social entrepreneurs are trying to do it and and i hope that it will be more and more um, um people doing it and i want to close this conversation maybe and wrap it up with some uh, sound of uh, the water because I think uh, what is uh, I was thinking what is fluid and I think it's it's actually really beautiful to think about water and um, that it's just flowing
Thank you so much for this uh, great conversation. It was a pleasure talking to you both, dialoguing with you both. I also want to thank you, and I came to that mind, uh, came to that idea right now that if we talk about fluid work and fluid organizations, we also have to talk about um, fluid money and fluid capital and how to, how to, how can we con control or redistribute th those streams. And you gave me a lot to think about. Thank you very much. Thank you too.